Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Friday edition of Lunch with Lincoln. I am Reed Galen, one of the co-founders here at the Lincoln Project. Uh, I want to welcome my guest for today, Trigby Olson. Uh, Trigby and I go back uh, many, many moons together. Um, I don't think either one of us had hair when we met, but it was a long time ago. I promise you that. Um, so, Trigby, thanks for joining me tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me, Reed. Well, I should say tonight because we're in Trigby's undisclosed location. It is tonight, but where I am yeah. is today. <laughs> it's true. So, hey, Trigby, I want to cover a couple of things. Um, I want to talk about the Fox News ad that, that we at the Lincoln Project dropped yesterday. But before I do that, I want to talk about uh, the January 6th Select Committee. Um, earlier this week, Speaker Pelosi uh, nixed out uh, Jim Banks and uh, Jim Jordan from uh, participating in it because they were both outright seditionists. Uh, in response, uh, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy pulled his whole slate of members uh, and said, you know, this is illegitimate uh, and went into their normal sort of snowflake mode. Um, there was a lot of surprise that uh, Pelosi did this. And there was a lot of, you know, sort of not surprising inside the beltway, sort of like, oh, my gosh, you know, she's ruining the last vestiges of bipartisanship. So like, how did you see that play out, given your expertise and sort of how to deal with authoritarian regimes? Um, we, we put together, you know, the seven rules that you have about yep. dealing with authoritarian. So how did you see that play out this week? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's been fascinating to watch. Um, you know, the first thing I guess that, that I think, you know, Kevin McCarthy is not very good at the zero sum game. And I was thinking about this this much. morning. Yeah. <laughs> no, he really isn't. Well, maybe filling a suit very empty. Right. But um, I, I was thinking about this this morning, right? So, um, you know, McCarthy, like a lot of these, you know, like pretty much all the autocrats, right? Like they want the legitimacy that comes with the win-win Democratic game. Um, and Kevin McCarthy, he, you know, Tommy Thompson, who I worked for a long time ago, used to say two kinds of politicians, those who want to be and those who want to do. Kevin McCarthy's just a guy who wants to be somebody, right. right? But he's not very good at the zero sum game. And, and in fact, one of the rules for dealing with autocrats, I, I say practice zero sum judo, right? Take the strengths and turn it back on. Um, what you're seeing here is, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Liz Cheney are putting on an absolute clinic at kicking Kevin McCarthy's ass at zero sum judo. Um, then they're just one toing him over and over again. And he isn't very good at the game. Um, Pelosi and, and Cheney are demonstrating themselves to be really good at making Kevin McCarthy dependent on their actions. Um, and they're really putting on a clinic. In fact, I used to think Angela Merkel was probably the best in the world at, at doing that to Putin. But Pelosi and Cheney are demonstrating themselves to be almost to the Merkel level of whatever black belt or whatever the top judo level you can be. Um, they're flipping him and tossing him. And so let me, let me turn, you know, to the, to the media for a second, because whether or not it was, you know, you know, your normal talking, you know, heads of Chris Saliza at CNN, who's had bad takes for years um, or Politico, which has had its own share of bad takes for years. They still see this in the context of Republican versus Democrat. Yeah, they, they, for do. whatever reason, cannot get out of the, their 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 eyes out of the prism that like somehow any of this is normal. So when Nancy Pelosi takes the power she has and uses it, which is normal for Republicans, right? Nobody nobody's surprised when Mitch McConnell does it, right? They may kick and scream, but they're not surprised. But somehow when Nancy Pelosi does it, she's giving up on the bipartisanship of Capitol Hill, which let's be clear, like hasn't existed in 25 years. Like what, what, why are they having such a hard time getting out of like this old line thinking that like, this is all somehow like just, you know, one more step in, you know, American history and it'll all go back to normal eventually. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is the, you know, the game, the game that everyone would want to play the, the win, win, democratic game, um, which you can't play when another side is playing zero sum. Um, it's the game that people like Saliza and, and others, you know, understand they're comfortable with certain to them. Um, and so they'd like to go back to it. 
but they're a little bit like ostriches with their head in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't play win-win when one side is zero sum. In terms of the Pelosi question, um, you know, it is what Mitch McConnell does. Mitch McConnell, as you know, I mean, I worked in that general world at one point in my career, and they're some of the most Machiavellian people you'll ever encounter. Right. Um, and they're pretty zero sum. Um, in this case, they think they can manage Trump and they can't. Um, I don't know, you know, Democrats, Democrats and the left sometimes, you know, they're maybe they're better people than we who worked in Republican politics because they they're so they want it to be about policy and big ideas, whereas the other side is playing this game of just hammering them. Um, now that Nancy Pelosi's picked up the mantle and's doing it, there's a lot of them who still long for that other game. Well, because it's the only one they've ever known, right? And yeah. and you know, with with all of this stuff too, with you know, you know, to your to to illustrate your zero sum uh, concept. I mean, I, I my my version of that is. Um, Democrats play chess and Republicans eat the pieces. So um, exactly. it's just not the same deal. And look, as, as you and I both came up in Republican politics, I mean, and for our viewers, you should understand this, like as a young Republican operative, it's just win, do what right. you have to win. Um, right. Because a couple of things, one, as McConnell famously says, you know, winners make policy and losers go home. And secondly, right. Almost no one remembers the last campaign as far as voters are concerned. No one remembers, oh, that was a really ugly, ugly campaign, right? They really went nasty on each other. Voters just don't well, have that long a memory. I mean, that's the other thing. We're conditioned, right? Like we have been conditioned for a long time if you worked in Republican politics um, from, from your very early days. Um, it, it, you know, tax cuts or tax policy or any of those kinds of things. It's not about that. It's about taking and making an example. Um, and it can be the one in a million example and driving it as this is the narrative that we're going to use. Whereas Democrats typically want to have big conversations about policy and things like that. Now, Nancy Pelosi isn't having any conversations with policy about Kevin McCarthy. Right? And that's part of the reason why she's just clobbering. And then she's right. got Liz Cheney doing a two for honor because Liz Cheney knows that game too, right? Because she came up in the same generation as we did. Right. In, in well, and, and we know politics. who her dad is, right? Who, <laughs> right. Who, who understand? Who has long understood the the levers of power in Washington as well, if not better than anybody. Right. And he might be more Machiavellian than Mitch McConnell, right? For sure. So, uh, there, I mean, the reality is they're just they're just clobbering them. And look at what Jim Jordan was left with, right? Like Jim Jordan when he stood up there and speaking. He was like a child going on and on. Oh, it's about where were the police, right? Like anybody who watched went on, you can ask that question, but like, that's not what it's about. And, and between what Pelosi did to him and what Cheney was doing to him, um, he and McCarthy were just left with a lot of nothing. But let, let me ask you this, because you've seen now that, you know, with Jordan, they're blaming the cops, right? Which yeah. is funny because they want to be the party of back the blue. Right. Um, and then, you know, on, on, I think it was Fox news. If it was not last night, it was two nights ago. You know, Kevin McCarthy says, well, where was the national guard? Well, he knows damn well where the national guard was. They were sitting in a barrack somewhere because they had been specifically ordered by the acting secretary of defense to not move, to literally mm -hmm. sit where they were and not move. And right. as everything unraveled at the Capitol that day, it was not Donald Trump who was sitting in, you know, the, the residence at the White House eating McDonald's and, and laughing at all of this. But it was Mike Pence, the vice president, who had to call the Pentagon and say, get those guys over here and get them over here now. And right. so my question to you is, like, are they digging themselves into a deeper rhetorical hole with a lot of their key messages, obviously being supportive of the military, being supportive of, of law enforcement, because... They don't they don't have anybody else to blame. So they've got to blame sort of the 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 actors on the field, the individual cops, the individual members of the National Guard, because ultimately it does come down. It was Trump's fault. I think they're in a huge box um, and they're in a huge box because, right, for one thing, they're stuck doing Donald Trump's bidding, mm. who's sitting at the top of this illiberal vertical. Um, second, you know, my experience, whether it's Putin or 
Lukashenko or Chavez or whoever, name of your dictator, Mugabe back in the day, right? Like they have to live in the present. They're all about surviving the moment. So there is no future. And the past is always troublesome to them right. because they always have, have a Goncharic line with, that they've crossed where, you know, uh, they've done something. And in the, I call it the, Gon, the Gonchar line because it, Alexander Lukashenko murdered an opposition politician and there was no going back from it, right? Like he gives up power, he's going to have to answer for it. They've all, they all have those things. And, and one six is that for Jim Jordan, it's that for Kevin McCarthy, right? So they're just trying to do anything they can to survive the moment. Um, but they're really struggling with it and they're struggling with it because Pelosi won, um, practiced one of the rules, which is the Stalin rule. You know, she and Liz Cheney probably don't agree on much on policy, but they're both on team democracy. And they said this matters. Right. right. So they're, we're going to work together. They, they've got the rule that they know Kevin McCarthy cannot live in the past. And the future is a real problem for him as this thing unfolds. So he's groping around in the in the present. And so those two combined, coupled with the fact that because Liz Cheney agreed if Kinzinger signs on, which would be a great move for Adam Kinzinger, it'd be a great move for Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. It'd be a great move for America to have another Republican on there. Quite frankly, is if they can get other reasonable ones on there, right? Because it adds a bipartisanship, no matter how much Kevin McCarthy screams. Um, they're, they're just in a real box. I mean, their day of reckoning seems to be coming. Um, so, and I think you asked why is Trump saying so little? Uh, or maybe he asked me that before we got on, but uh, I think it's because he may see that some of that's coming that way. And quite frankly, if he's willing to hang Mike Pence, he's willing to hang Jim Jordan or Kevin McCarthy oh, too. Without a second thought. I mean, yeah. I mean, he, he knows. Um, I mean, if there's one thing we know about Trump is that he's, he intuits, you know, people's weaknesses and he knows that McCarthy is over a barrel. And he would drop Kevin McCarthy like a bad habit in a heartbeat um, if he thought he needed to to save himself, right? Which was, we sure. should assume will happen. Um, so um, on this, on the one six committee, the hearings are going to start, I believe, next Tuesday with with the police officers. And and Trigby uh, Lisa fifty five on YouTube asked, should the one six committee hearings be held in prime time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. To me, what happened on 1-6, and I've talked about this a fair amount on Twitter, and you and I have talked about this a lot, Reed, <laughs> including on Signal as it was going on live, right? Mm -hmm. Like the problem with what happened on 1-6 is it normalized violence in our political process. Right. And I used to start my presentations when I would be working with, with those fighting for freedom around the world with a simple presence. Every country throughout history and time either decides – how they're going to govern themselves at the ballot box or on the streets. Right. Right. Those are your two options. What, what we saw there was people trying to decide governance on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it should be in prime time. Um, it, it is, I agree with Steve uh, Schmidt. It's bigger than nine 11. Um, probably bigger than Pearl Harbor. We're talking about events that are as big, go back to, probably Gettysburg in terms of their significance in terms of the United States. Like literally a moment was America going to survive as we knew it. And well, I, I think just, those are the only four I can think of. I just remember as a kid um, sitting in my grandmother's house during the summer in Ohio, many moons ago, watching the Ali North hearings, right? Mm -hmm. During the whole Iran Contra thing. And I was, I mean, I grew up in a political household. So I was, probably just like, I don't know if it was 10, you know, if I was 11 or whatever it was, but mm -hmm. under able to understand enough of it just based on the fact that I'd, I'd been around it so much as a kid, but it certainly was appointment television in the eighties. Um, and, and I hope that, um, that we shouldn't expect that any national networks will run it uh, live because, you know, that's just not what they'll do, but we should assume that CNN and MSNBC will run it live and Fox news will run, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, circus review. Uh, while it's all going on. Yeah, it will be Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio opining with zero credibility about Cuba, right? Right, Because they lost the credibility to speak to those people on the streets because the people on the streets in places like Cuba fully understand that they're not practicing what they preach at home. I mean, it's, right. you know, well, I mean, what does it say about, a you know, 
their, their credibility. I saw Elise Stefanik opining about that stuff. And as you know, she's on the National Endowment for Democracy's board. Right. And she undermines the credibility of the entire thing. Because if, if Elise Stefanik were a politician in Belarus or in Cuba, she'd be getting written up in, by Ned in the, in the Human Rights Report. Right. Right. The Democracy Report. So, right. so, yeah, look up, guys, look up the National Endowment for Democracy. They have, you know, I think a very uh, admirable mission. Um, but absolutely. you have to ask yourself the question of how can you pursue that mission when you have someone like Elise Stefanik, who serves on your board of directors? I, I, and, and frankly, uh, the International Republican Institute, which, Trig, I know you've done a ton of work for. My dad mm -hmm. did a ton of work for. I think Rick and Stuart both did, too. You yeah. know, they have someone like a Lindsey Graham sitting on their board or a Dan Sullivan, who I think might be the chair now. Like. They're all yeah, complicit, is. right? They're all they're all um, collaborators in this stuff. And the idea well, that they sit in these groups and, and are able to, you know, look down on other countries, you know, as being not democratic enough is, I think, bullshit. Yeah, I mean, so the leader of the Belarusian opposition, the woman Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who who beat Alexander Lukashenko in an election, she was a housewife whose husband was going to run. He got thrown in jail, and and by quirk of their election law, she could turn in the signatures under his name mm -hmm. for him and be the candidate. She clobbered Lukashenko. Right. She is in Washington. She was meeting with Lindsey Graham. And, you know, I think about being in Riga with Lindsey Graham with the Belarusians and McCain and, and Lindsey Graham saying, you know, and what she was doing again, uh, you know, even Lukashenko must honor the will of the people. And yet Lindsey Graham, and it isn't like Belarusians don't know this, Lindsey Graham's calling the Secretary of State of Florida and saying, "Hey, like, what's going on here? Like, the right. hypocrisy of that is unbelievable." And 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 you know, yes, it's important that he meets with people like that. But like, they understand that, and the people they empower are people like Lukashenko, because Lukashenko is going to be like, "So what? You met with Lindsey Graham? What does he right. know? He's not afraid of him, right? He's not. Yeah." So speaking of hypocrisy, uh, Trivia, I want to want to switch gears here for a second. So. Yeah. This uh, yesterday, the Lincoln Project dropped an ad uh, on Fox News called Fox is Killing Us. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a minute of, you know, and, and you guys can find it on our YouTube page or B. Maybe we can have uh, we can repost it to Twitter and Facebook so folks can see it um, when we're done here. Uh, but basically just laying out, you know, whether or not it's Tucker Carlson or mm -hmm. uh, Laura Ingram or uh, that goon on uh, Fox and Friends, uh, Kilmeade, uh, you know, yeah. telling people basically, you know, don't trust the vaccine science, um, you know, and and what we saw this week was that Sean Hannity was it yesterday or two days yeah. ago, two days ago, said, you got to take this seriously, got to take this seriously. Um, you know, Mitch McConnell said it. Ron DeSantis said it. Kay Ivey of Alabama said it. Right. You've got you guys. And so one is, you know, Fox is, you know, they are the bullhorn into into the conservative, you know, 40 percent of the country uh, and their actions are having, you know, deadly effects on people. But two, one thing I think we saw, and this is really, I think, the more interesting piece of it is that Sean Hannity on Wednesday says you got to take this seriously, clearly gets backlash from his, you know, on his Twitter feed or his Facebook page or whatever. And on his radio show yesterday, he says, don't believe the science, don't believe the science, don't believe the science. And on third, last night, he <coughs> goes on you know, his show and says, I never said don't get the vaccine. I never mm -hmm. said that. I never mm -hmm. said get the vaccine, guys. I, you know, I only said you should take you know, your medical. So is this one more of those things where, you know, and then you have a Marjorie Taylor Greene who's laughing about you know, kids in her district dying of COVID. So Wait, what has happened? I mean, did they get the polling memo? Did McConnell get the polling memo and say, you guys are getting crushed on this electorally? So he went and did what he did because you said something the last time we talked about your rules, which is authoritarians will only seem to do the right thing when it's in their interest. So is that what right. we're seeing here? And then what's yeah, I mean, the, it's, what it's, is the backlash it, telling us about well, who's really interesting? <laughs> so autocrats and their enablers, Sean Hannity is an enabler for all of this, right? right. They have to live in the present. Like the, 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 well, what are you saying in the past is a problem, but it's a problem for him now. And this is where, where the Lincoln project ad was genius, right? Cause it, 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 it completely framed them having to speak about it and the polling numbers coming back showing clearly, and, and you and I know how this goes, right? Probably wasn't Mitch who got the polling numbers. It was probably Stephen Law and Josh Holmes who got the polling numbers and they went to Mitch and we're like, 
holy shit, right. we got problems here. And then it went down the food chain and up and up the food chain. Um, but, uh, you know, Sean Hannity's problem is, is that he's made his bed and now he has to constrict himself a thousand different ways to rationalize sleeping in it. Um, and it's, you know, I love the show Billions, right? right? Like there's a great line in Billions. You can't take Jenna Jameson to bed and think you're going to wake up with Snow White. That's exactly what Sean Hannity has done, right? Like, and now he's having to pay the consequences for it. And so he comes out and says, well, I, people should get vaccinated or, or soft cells that I never said it. He gets backlash. Now he's got to go the other way. And the more we, and I don't just mean the Lincoln Project, but all of us, the more we wake up every day and think, how do we put these people in a position where they have to constrict themselves, the stronger we're going to be. Right. And, and to that point about Fox and the ad, right, Comcast refused to run. Right. I wonder how many of the people who are on here understand that when they pay their cable bill or they pay their satellite bill, whether they watch Fox News or not, whether they watch OANN or not, whether they watch what's the other one, Newsmax, Spicer, Spicer TV, um, <laughs> the uh, they're, they're paying two dollars a month or five dollars a month, or in the case of Fox, maybe ten or twelve for the cable company to provide that. They need to call their cable company and say, "I ain't paying that anymore." Right. Well, so just on that front, you know, guys. So this it's Comcast, it's Directv, it's Cox Spectrum. Yeah. Um, Joe Trippy uh, had a conversation with someone. And, uh, and the person said, so I called DirecTV and said, I don't want Fox anymore. And they said, well, we can't decouple it. And they said, well, I'm quitting then. And they said, well, how about we give you $70 off? And she's like, great. Um, so do that. Right? <laughs> That's, right. But, um, That's right. And then the other part, too, was I saw something online on social media earlier today uh, that a woman called, I think it was Spectrum or Cox or one of them, and said, you know, why, you, know you guys have to get rid of Fox. You know, I'm gonna, you're going to lose me. And the person on the other end of the phone said, uh, well, we need millions of you to quit to do that. And, and right. Rick, on, Rick Wilson online said, well, hey, get to work, gang. Um, yeah. Because, you know, here's the thing, and this is what we saw with Toyota a couple of weeks ago, too. With all these companies, guys, it's not like we don't have other options now, right? Now, right. I may require Comcast because that's the only way I can get Internet where I live. But, like, I don't have to subscribe to their cable service, Right. I don't have to nope. subscribe to their phone service. I mean, I, I don't know. The, I mean, other than live sports, Trig, I don't know that I watch any live television anymore. Um, and so, you know, you know, whether or not it's Netflix or Prime or whatever, a lot, you know, or Hulu, a lot of folks can get, you know, the stuff they need without ever in com you know, coming in contact with one of these cable providers. And, and I think they're probably feeling that, too. And so now I think we should apply some more economic pressure to them to get them to do the right thing business wise and politically. So I used to do work, you know, public affairs work with one of them. Um, I'm not going to say which one, but um, one of the things that I learned during the process of that is um, once you sign up, and this is true with anything like mobile phones, cable, any of these kinds of things, the, the, it, is, it is in their interest to keep you because the cost of acquisition is so great. It's right. why iPhones were discounted. Service and sales, right? Correct. It's always more expensive to get a new customer than keep the one you got. Correct. So if you're Verizon, T-Mobile, or AT&T, and you lose a subscriber to another place, you're willing to give a lot to keep them in the system because it's all about reoccurring revenue and losing that is a real problem. Right. And I mean, if, the, if all the people who follow the Lincoln Project and they each got one friend to call their providers and say, we don't want OANN or Comcast. We're not paying for it. At a minimum, we'd get those people a bunch of money back that would hurt their bottom line. And they would be saying to all those networks, tone it down. You're killing us. And we aren't going to be able to give you as much in carriage fees. Or, uh, you know, they might just say, screw it. But more likely what they're going to do is they take money out of Rupert Murdoch's pocket. And I'm pretty sure that that probably is the one thing that would change things pretty fast because that's going to bleed down the food chain. Sean well, Hannity isn't going to have his $30 million a year contract or whatever it is. Yeah. And I mean, from our experience in that world, remember that you have, 
the external affairs people, the PR people, the government affairs people, the lobbyists who say, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this because of this political thing or that political thing, or, you know, we need to get this deal done. And then you have the business side, right? The right. sales, the marketing, the operations, all that other stuff who are like, hey, we're losing customers, you idiots. Can you please right. stop that? And, and as you and I know, it's the, the, yeah, they side with the business guys. Right. The CEO Almost is always going to side with the business units because what? HR, PR, government affairs are cost centers. Right, they're cost centers. Mm -hmm. they, they don't they don't add to the bottom line. You know, they're, they're they, and they, as I like to say, they only show up when something bad has happened. Right, and yeah. make you do something you don't want to do or say something you don't want to say. Um, so, Trigby, a couple of questions here. One is, um, what you're a, you're a Wisconsin native. One of the one of our guests or one of our viewers asked, um, what about Ron Johnson? Is he going to run? Um, if so, you know, what do we, what do you think is his biggest weakness aside from being just a generally terrible person? I mean, Ron Johnson's biggest problem is Ron Johnson, <laughs> kind of a Fair jackass. Enough. Um, I have no real insight. I will say I saw, you know, he's hedging now. Um, Ron Johnson, if Ron Johnson thinks he's going to lose and get humiliated, he probably doesn't run. Uh, the guy's got a huge ego. Now, that being said, he might just decide to run anyway, um, you know, and screw it. I do know from talking to Republicans back home, um, there's an awful lot of them who would be a lot happier with Mike Gallagher or Sean Duffy or anybody but Ron Johnson as the candidate. Um, you've also got Reince Priebus playing around there. Scott Walker is in it, always oh. playing around there. Oh, Trigby, um, could we have could we have a Walker Priebus primary, please? That would be delicious. <laughs> I would, would come be. to Wisconsin and tease Kurt until I exploded. Yeah, I yeah <laughs> yeah. I think um, <laughs> I I don't know what ha I I do know this. I think there's a better chance that Aaron Rodgers plays for the Packers this season than Ron Johnson gets reelected. Well, I would say that. From your lips to God's ears. Um, another one of our uh, viewers, Trigby, asked, um, what do you think happens if Republicans win the House and or the Senate next year? What is the, what is the practical outcome of that come January 2023? So so when, when after this is over or after you get done watching this, if you're watching it after the fact, I want you to go to something called the Economist Intelligence Unit. And I want you to look at uh, that they rate democracies. They have a global democracy index. And I want people to look at, there's six, six subcategories. They, they have a macro ranking. We've now fallen to a flawed democracy. But one of the six categories is functioning of government. And what they will see is every time we've had divided government, uh, it has fallen. And that is a leading indicator of bigger problems within any democracy. You know, when I work around the world, it's the place to start. It's the gold standard. Um, could they win? Yeah, absolutely, they could win, and it would be uh, it would be really bad. I mean, you know, they don't want to have a select committee hearing on the Capitol being stormed. But if if Kevin McCarthy is Speaker of the House, I'm sure we'll have six Hunter Biden committees that make Benghazi look like a walk in the park. Well, I I. Now, I, I say this with all the weird... You probably have a Lincoln project. I, I was just about to say that committee. I would expect that, you know, we'd be sitting next to each other in a witness chair. Um, <laughs> you might be. Our, uh, our, our evil deeds. Um, right. So, Trigby, as, as we go into the weekend here, what else are you looking at before we, uh, before we let our folks get back to their weekend? So... I mean, I think it will be interesting to see, you know, Pelosi seems to be making rumbling. She's going to put Kinsinger on, which you and I right. talked about in a podcast. And two days later, she, she went down that path. So, like, if she's listening, I think both Reed and I would like to see you put Kinsinger on. And we'd be um, flattered if the speaker were. That, that we would be. Um, and, um, you know, I think that will be, the you know, the big story. I think this woman who's running against Elise Stefanik, I don't know much about her other than I saw quite a bit of news today about her. She seems impressive. Um, and I think what's going to be fascinating as the Olympics unfold is watch for the conservative outrage complex to try and find, like they did with women's soccer, um, as many examples as they can of athletes supposedly being unpatriotic and trying to make that into a huge thing. 
And I would just add one last thing, Reed. I'm gonna start, on for people who follow me on Twitter, you know I'm gonna be doing this. Um, I'm gonna start putting out some tweets as they relate to the rules, rule number one, which is play the game we're in versus the game we know. I'm gonna start putting out on Mondays and Fridays um, who are the people that are doing the best job of playing the game that we're forced to play and who are the people that are failing miserably by playing the game we know and not being constructive. So well, I hope yeah, people will follow that. Everyone watching, please uh, follow Trigby. So before we let everybody get out of here, um, just dropped today um, the latest Lincoln Project podcast. I had Beto O'Rourke on, great conversation mm -hmm. about voting, um, what he saw in Congress as things were sort of devolving into what they are today. Uh, please don't forget that uh, Tuesday and Thursday nights we have the breakdown uh, with Rick uh, Wilson and Tara Setmayer, and Wednesday nights uh, we're speaking with uh, Maya May and Lisa Senecal. Always thank you everyone for listening. Trigby, thank you for joining me. Hope everybody has a great and safe weekend, and we will see you on Monday. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, guys.